Welcome to our Vision Sunday. Vision Sunday is really just about us sharing what we believe God's heart is for the church for this year. And our theme for this year is actually build your church. Amen. So we sang the song. Isn't that song amazing? Build your church. And when you say build your church, most people immediately think, okay, here we go. We're going to talk about the building project. Well, no, I'm going to speak about that a little bit later. What I'm speaking about right now is the fact that Jesus is building us. Amen. He's building us large on the inside. He's, he's growing, a, he's building a spiritual house made out of living stones, which we'll get into in just a moment. But our theme scripture for the year is Matthew 16, verse 18. It says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Isn't that an incredible scripture? Jesus saying, listen, I am building my church, and the gates of hell themselves, they can do nothing about what I'm about to do in my church. And church, I want you to understand, when I say church, I'm not speaking about the brick and mortar that we're sitting in this morning. This is just a house. I'm speaking about every single person who is seated with their blessed behinds on these chairs. You are the house of God, the spiritual house that God is building. Can I get at least one amen on that? Many years ago, when I was a youth pastor at Christian Family Church in Cape Town, I had to communicate this scripture because I was preaching about this very scripture to the youth, and I used two specific illustrations. The first thing I did was I told them I want you to break up into groups of six, and we had 400 youth on a Friday night, and I said, I want you to break up into groups of six, and I want you to build out of bodies. In other words, use your bodies to construct a working motorbike, all right? So it had to have wheels, it had to have handlebars, it had to have a seat, and it had to move forward once it was constructed. And so we sat back for 20 minutes and watched these, these multiple groups take six people and try to construct a motorbike. There was a lot of laughter. There was a lot of shouting. There was a lot of arguing. There was a lot of complaining. And there was even some tears in some groups. And um, after that, they came and they, they, they tried to produce this working motorbike. And then I did a second exercise. I said, okay, what I want you to do is now break up into groups of 10 and so we would have about 40 groups. I said, break up into groups of 10, and I want you to construct a house. It has to have a roof, windows, a door, a picket fence, and it has to have a chimney, and they all have to work, all right? And so we sat back for half an hour and watched them to try to construct this house. Absolute chaos ensued. Chaos ensued. Can everyone say chaos? Chaos, chaos ensued. There was shouting. There was screaming. There were people leaving church to go home. Um, there was some laughter, a lot of crying, and at the end of it, about six of the 40 groups were able to produce something that resembled maybe possibly a house of some sort. And so we realized it was a massive failure, but it proved a point. You see, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2 verse 5, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Church, I want you to know, we are being built as a house. We are living stones, but get this, Jesus gets to work with us. He gets to use us to build his house. We all have a mind of our own, right? We like things done our way. We don't wanna do it his way. We don't wanna do it anyone else's way. So what we do is we, 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 we fight, we complain, we cry, we run away. And eventually Jesus has to take us. He has to take us by the scruff of the neck, correct us, put us back into the building. Let me tell you, if I was God, the world would look very, very different. It'd probably be empty right now. But God is patient, amen, and thank God I'm not God. God is patient and He's kind, and He takes the things which are unworkable, and He works in us to construct in us a spiritual house out of living stones. We are all living stones this morning, amen. The problem with this is, think about it like this, living things move. Ever noticed? Try, try to get to change your child's nappy. If those have had children, try to, try to change your child's nappy. It's like, okay, here you are, put your bum in the nappy, and then what they do is they squirm and roll around, they crawl away, they scream, they kick, they kick themselves in the face. Sometimes they even pee pee in their own faces, which is, it's a boy, it's a boy, it has to be a boy. But uh, these, these things happen, right? Because we move, and living things tend to move. 
And this is what Jesus has to work with. But think of it like this. In Romans 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now, that is a beautiful scripture. Use your bodies to worship God. Place yourself on the altar and worship God as a living sacrifice. The problem is sacrifices that are living move. If we feel offended, now I'm going to get off the altar. If you said something I disagree with, I'm going to get off the altar. If you said something I don't want to do, I'm going to get off the altar. If I, if I feel I've been treated unfairly, I'm going to get off the altar. And Jesus has to take all these bits and pieces, these living stones, and he has to construct a spiritual house with us. I was going to say God help him, but he is God. But you know, just, just think about that for a second, how difficult and how challenging it must be. So this is why we have Vision Sunday, to focus us on what Jesus wants to do in his church. Amen? Jesus is asking us to be these living stones that remain on the altar so that he can do a work in us and build a spiritual house with living stones. I don't know if you can relate to this. Um, when my children were younger, we used to do puzzles with them. And I often almost lost my salvation trying to do a puzzle, a four-piece puzzle, just four pieces, just one, two, three, four. It's not difficult. And then what you do is you instruct your child. You say, look at the puzzles. Isn't it pretty? Yeah, that would be pretty. <laughs> they didn't speak, they just gurgled. Anyway, <laughs> so, so then you say, is, isn't it pretty? Yes, Daddy, it's so pretty. Okay, no, no, let's do the puzzle. You see, this piece fits in there. And then they take it and they just shove it in another place and they smack it down. I want to lose my mind. I want to pull my hair out, right? I, I'm, like, I'm like, it's not this difficult. It's four pieces. I've already put two pieces in. You've only got to put one more piece in. One more piece to make it. It cannot be this difficult. And I want to lose my mind, right? Anyone relate to that? And then you get this puzzle that's just wrong colors all over the place, total mess up. I mean, pieces are snapped because the piece puzzle broke. And you go, you go like... How do I do this? I mean, I made you, and now I have to keep you breathing. <laughs> God has to work with us like that every single day. We are like those, those children that sit there with a puzzle piece. And so this is the thing. If a piece of a puzzle doesn't fit in, or if it's missing, the puzzle fails. It doesn't work, right? It's unsuccessful. Jesus is working with us to fit everything together to build up the spiritual home made out of living stones. We need to stop moving so much. Amen? <laughs> You're like, sure, I think so too. <laughs> sure. I, I, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, I, I actually, I was, I was laying in my bed. The power went out at 8 o'clock. Thank you, ESCOM. And um, I was laying in my bed, and I was thinking, I was saying to God, I just wouldn't do it. Father, I have so much respect for you. I just wouldn't do it. I don't know how to manage 7 billion people, or at least 1.5 billion people that call themselves saints, to, to build up a house, a spiritual house out of living stones that just don't want to stop moving. I, I couldn't do it. And I think God laughed, but I wasn't sure because it was quiet. So have you ever considered that if we are called living stones, there are certain characteristics that cause us to be classified as living, all right? And that's what I want to speak into a little bit today. There are certain things that classify us as living, and we have certain needs to ensure that we can sustain life, and that's really what, about our, what our Vision Sunday is about this week. And so I've come up with three points that I think are vital for us to sustain life, and the first one is this. We need connection. We must connect. We must belong. Church, I want you to understand that church isn't something that you come to on a Sunday just because you have nothing else to do. We belong to this family. It is a family of God. We have to belong to the church. In Psalm 133 verse 1, it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is when the brethren uh, live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on, on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down over the collar and of his robes. It is as the dew of Hermon were falling 
on Mount Zion. Think about this. He's saying, when you as a church live together, when you work together, when there is unity, I command blessing. It's like when you walk in oneness, when you walk in understanding, when you walk together, I put my anointing on you. The Holy Spirit comes upon you. There's an empowering that comes upon you because you are one. You are unity, right? Mm. Wouldn't that be amazing if the whole church was like that all the time, but it isn't. The thing about the puzzle is if it, one piece is missing, the puzzle fails. And some people actually feel in our world that they don't belong in the puzzle. But I want you to know this, church, we need each other. Amen? See, a puzzle may be beautiful, it may be extravagant, it may be intricate. But if one piece is missing, the puzzle simply doesn't work, it fails. And we have to understand, if we want to grow into what God has for us as the church, we have to belong. We have to have connection. We must connect with one another. I don't consider you the church. I consider you my family. Before me sits brothers and sisters, all right? Because God doesn't have grandchildren. We're all brothers and sisters. Even your children are your brothers and sisters. Deal with that part. Brother, come here. <laughs> brother, your brother's going to give you a hiding now, brother. Come here. People want to do things on their own. They don't want to follow the rules. They don't want to do what everyone else is doing. They want to be unique and independent, just like everyone else. Get that. It's, a, it's, it's actually a, it's a revelation. So it's important that we become living stones and that we become the spiritual house that God is building, but we have to connect and we have to belong. Likewise, to be living stones who are built into a spiritual house, we must enjoy God's presence and have our presence enjoyed by Him. One of the important things is this. Physical contact, connection is so powerful. They did an experiment many years ago without even knowing they were doing an experiment. It was in a hospital in the UK, and what they found was in the pediatric ward, the children who were closest to the door were recovering at speeds twice as fast as the children further away from the door. And they weren't quite sure as to why this was happening. Maybe it was because they could see the light or they could hear the conversations happening in the passages. And what they eventually found out was at night when they were doing the rounds, the nurses would go into the first two or three beds and just touch the kids, make sure that they were okay and move and walk outside. And the kids that were touched, the kids that experienced connection, recovered twice as fast. Let me tell you, there's something powerful about connection. We need each other. But just like we need each other, we need to enjoy the presence of God. Amen. We need to enjoy the presence of God. Um, I was at a conference this week, and one of our speakers said, have you thought about this? You know, you go sometimes, you go with, with friends, and you spend an evening braying, like South Africans do. Pap and flies. I don't, I don't like pap. But you, you, you go to this braai, and after you come home, you say, I loved being there. I so enjoyed the presence of the people that were there. They made me laugh. They made me feel good about myself. I felt encouraged. I felt strengthened. I felt better about who I am. I left there feeling better. When last have you said that about God? When last have you come out of the presence of God and said, you know what? I, I, I leave the presence of God. I've come out of a service this morning. I feel encouraged. I feel strengthened. I've connected intimately with my Father. I felt faith rise in my heart. I just feel a sense of purpose. Spending time in His presence changed me today. When last have we said that? Because let me tell you, as much as we need connection with people, we need connection with God. See, we must get to the point in our lives where we are enjoying the presence of God and God's enjoying our presence. Amen? When last have you enjoyed the presence of God and been comfortable in that place? Do you come together as the spiritual house because you are forced to? Do we come together on a Sunday because we are forced to? Our wives, our husbands, our children put pressure on us? Or because you genuinely desire to be in the presence of the living God? These are questions we must ask ourselves. Amen? The second thing is, the, th the second requirement for life is this, sustenance, food and drink, which speaks of equipping and empowering food. If you're going to be living stones that Jesus uses to build a spiritual house, we must eat and drink spiritually. We must be equipped and empowered 
to live as living stones. Amen. In Matthew 4, you actually read the story about Jesus. Um, he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And the Bible says there he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. He doesn't eat. And then the Bible says something profound. It says he was hungry. Would you imagine? <laughs> after 40 days of no eating and no drinking, it says Jesus, I mean, after no eating, it says Jesus was hungry. And while he was in that place of hunger, the Bible says that the devil comes to him and tries to tempt him to eat. And he says, you know, if you say who you, you, know, if you, say who you are, you are, then, then just tell these stones to turn into bread. And then Jesus makes this incredible statement. He says in Matthew 4, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you want to be a living stone to build up a spiritual house, let me tell you, you have to eat. You have to eat. You have to eat the Word of God daily. Amen? You know what happens is I wake up in the morning. I woke up this morning, I think, at 5.30. I went into the kitchen. I made myself some sautéed tomatoes with drizzle of balsamic, um, avocado pear mushrooms, and a slice of whole wheat toast. Aren't I healthy? But the fact is I'm already hungry. I, I, don't, know, I don't know. Have you ever experienced in your life that you have one meal and you go, well, that will settle me for life? It doesn't really work that way, right? You have to eat again. And so it's, it's amazing how we need sustenance to keep our physical bodies well, but we, we don't eat to strengthen our spiritual man. You know, we eat every single day, a couple of times a day, some people more than that. <laughs> but the fact is, when it comes to our spirit man, we just don't eat. We, we, we fast and fast and fast and fast and fast. And then we become weak, and we're not able to do the things that God tells us to do. You with me? We must have this love relationship with the Word of God. Listen to how the psalmist reveres the Word of God. In Psalm 119, verse 103, it says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Let me contextualize it for you. How sweet is your word to my mouth, like Canberries, double thick, top deck chocolate to my mouth. Chocolate. You know how we crave chocolate? Some people, I don't. I don't like chocolate. But you know how some people crave chocolate? You know how some people crave chocolate? It's like, give me chocolate or I die. My wife does it all the time. Th that's how the Word of God should be in our lives. It's like, it's like, give me food or I die. Our souls have to be in a place of desperation for the Word of God. If we're going to be a building uh, you know, if we're going to be living stones building a spiritual house, we have to be desperate for the Word of God. Amen. The second thing is drink. To thrive, living stones must drink deeply of the Holy Spirit daily. In John 7 verse 38, it says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water would flow within them. The problem with this is, so many of us, we, we, we have an experience in our lives we come to know Jesus, and then in 1966, we had the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And, and here, let me stop for a moment. We are Pentecostal. For those who don't understand what Pentecostals are, we are people that believe in being full of the Spirit of God, right? There is a salvation experience. There is a baptism in the Holy Spirit experience. And so we believe in being full of the Holy Spirit, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so what often happens is, and we believe in the gifts of the Spirit in operation. We believe in tongues. We believe in all these things. But we just stop operating in them. We become content, satisfied. And so back in 1966, when I came to know Jesus, I was overjoyed and ecstatic. Then I had the next experience of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I was like, yes, hallelujah, back in 1966, God blessed that day. It was a blessed day. I received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's now, you know, 2023, dude. There's been a long gap between 1966 and 1923, a big, long gap. The problem is this. Who of you in this church has ever experienced thirst, right? Don't, don't, if you don't put your hand up, you're a liar because every one of us, we experience thirst multiple times a day. I wake up in the morning and I have myself a glass of lemon juice with water, right? I quench that down. I mean, I, I, I sip that down. I, I get quenched with my thirst. Two hours later, I have another bottle of water at the office. Another three hours later, because I've now extended a little bit, I have another glass or two of water. By the time I finish the evening, I've had three liters plus of water a day, Right? That's me. I know some of you just like tea. Some of you like beer. God bless you all. Let's speak to those who like beer. Um, 
But the fact is this, is, is we, we have to quench our thirst constantly. Have you ever seen somebody who's thirsty in a dry place? Their tongue is dry. They can't move. They feel sick. They have no power. That's exactly what happens in our lives. We haven't received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We haven't been refreshed since 1966. Come on. This has to be a daily experience, a daily occurrence. Just like we drink water, we have to drink in of the presence of God constantly. Because you know what happens is we use the water we drink, and then we have to refresh ourselves with more. If we want to be a, a, a you know, living stones building a spiritual house, we have to ensure that we stay full of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. Amen? It's not a one-time experience. This happens constantly. In Ephesians 5 verse 18, it says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that word, filled, is actually in the present continuous tense. In other words, you can read it as follows. Do not get drunk on wine, in which is debauchery, but be being filled, or be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, it's not a one-time thing. Every morning when you wake up, you have to go, Father, I stand in your presence. I know that I've received salvation. I have the blood of Christ that has purged me and cleansed me, redeemed me and purchased me. I thank you this morning, Father God, that there is a lot that lays ahead of me. I pray for your empowering. Fill me with your spirit. Refresh me. May I, able, may I be able to live out this day with passion and purpose. Give me the power to live as a living stone, building up a spiritual house. Amen? Drink deeply daily. The third requirement is this, shelter. And this is where everyone goes, oh, stop. He's going to talk about the church, and you would be absolutely right, the building. Shelter. Release from home to make a difference. There are people that say that buildings are not important. There are people that say that buildings are unnecessary, and it's more important to give to missions and other more important spiritual causes. But the Bible tells us the following in Isaiah 54, verse 2. Enlarge the place of your tent. In those days, they lived in tents. It says, and let the curtains of your habitation be stretched out. Do not hold back. Do not spare expense. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. In other words, he's saying, you must increase capacity. You have become too small to hold the building. You've become too small to hold the church. Your church capacity is increasing. More people are coming to know Jesus. More people are getting saved. More people are being empowered to be released into the world to make a difference. We need to increase capacity. This is what the Bible says to us. Amen? A lot of people say the church is not the building, and I would say, correct, correct. The church is not the building, but you know what the building does do? The building has the capacity to house everyone who has to connect people to people and people to God. The building has the capacity to connect people to people to God, to equip people or empower them for life and ministry. And the building has capacity to house the church, the people, the living stones of the spiritual house that are going to release people into the world to make a difference. So this is a central point where people are sent from. Amen? Jesus is building his church. But he's not just building it willy-nilly. He's using living stones. He uses us to build his church. Amen? He says, I'm building, using living stones, I'm building a spiritual house but I need a place a capac with capacity to hold my church who are expansively growing. Isn't that exciting? If you want to be part of the spiritual house built with living stones that requires a larger tent, let's pray and ask God what he would have us give or sacrifice for the most important cause. A lot of people think it's easy to stand up on a platform and tell people, listen, we want your money. And that's not what I'm doing at all. You see, this church doesn't belong to me. It's his church. Yeah. Amen? In fact, this church belongs to every single one of us because we're all part of the church. And so God has got a plan for our church. And God has increased our capacity. And God has blessed us. And God has caused our influence to be expanded. And God is bringing more and more people in come to know him. 
It's time that we expand so that we can allow others to know the same grace that we know. Amen? I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning as we close. I want us to pray and then I want to just finish off. Father, we just put your hand on your heart. We got to do business with God now. Father, we, we acknowledge this morning that we are your church. We sang, we said, build your church. And what we're saying is when we sing those words is we're saying, Jesus, use us as the living stones, you being the chief cornerstone to build your church. Use us, build your church. Father, I pray for us this morning that we would be a people that hears your voice and does what you say. That, Lord God, we won't be independent and run our own way, doing our own thing, being offended, being upset, crying and, and, and stopping building. But, Lord God, we, we choose to, to walk in unity. We choose to love one another. Father, I do pray this morning that every one of us would connect and we'd connect meaningfully with one another and more importantly, we'd connect meaningfully with you. That we'd be intimate with you and that we'd be a family because you are building a spiritual house out of living stones. I pray, Father, that your people would have a great desire, a great hunger for your word. That, Lord God, they'd be desperate for your word. That they'd reach out and grab a hold of your word, digest, feast on it daily. That, Lord God, we as your people would be refreshed by your spirit. Breathe into us. May we drink deeply of your spirit every single day so that we can run and stay the course. And then, Father, I pray for our church building. I pray, Lord, that we would be sensitive to your leading, that we would hear your voice. I do pray for provision. I know, Father, in this house, there are people that you have stirred, people that you have spoken to. Lord, may we be the people that hear your voice and do what you tell us to do. We thank you that in the weeks and the months to come, Lord God, this house will be built. You would be glorified. Capacity would be increased and multitudes would come to know Jesus in your church. We honor you and we bless you in Jesus' mighty name. I'm gonna ask you to keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. You can drop your hands right now. You might be here this morning. You're saying to me, Brent, I'm standing here. I'm listening to you speak about this church that Jesus is building, but I don't think I'm part of it. I've never really received Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I want you to know this morning, you're not here by accident. You're here by divine design. God planned for you to be here so you could hear a message and so you could respond to his love this morning. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him would not die but have everlasting life. That means he loved you so much that he sent his son to die in your place to take your punishment and your sin so that you could receive him and you could have everlasting life. Jesus made this statement. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father but by me. If you don't go by Jesus, there is no way to get to heaven. Ask yourself this question. If I die today, where would I wake up to spend eternity? If you're not sure, you can be sure. I'm gonna give you an opportunity in a moment. I'm gonna count to three, and I'm gonna ask you, if you wanna receive Jesus this morning, it will be one of the best decisions you will ever make in your life because he takes you out of a life of darkness and separation from himself and he translates into the kingdom of his son. God adopts you as his child. Heaven becomes your home. Eternity is your portion. If that's you this morning and you'll know God's speaking to you because there'll be a stirring inside, your heart might be pounding in your chest. That is the Holy Spirit calling you to make a decision this morning and receive him. If that's you, while every head is bowed, while every eye is closed, no one's looking around, I'm gonna to count to three and I'm gonna ask you to take a bold step and just put up your hand when I do count. And I'm gonna include you in a prayer. I'm not gonna call anyone to the front. This is between you and the living God this morning. This is not between me and you. This is not between me and the, uh, you and the person next to you. So if that's you this morning, you're saying to me, Brent, I know God's stirring me right now. I know I need to make this decision. On the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to boldly put your hand up and I'm just gonna pray a mass prayer with you. One, two, three. Anyone this morning and says that, Brent, that's me. I need to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. God bless you. Anyone else this morning? God bless you. Anyone else this morning? Just put your hand up nice and high so we can see you. We just want to give you something also. Anyone else? I'm going to ask you to pray this with me, especially those with their hands up. Say, Father, this morning, I thank you for your love. Your word says, if I would say with my mouth that Jesus is Lord 
and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I would be saved. I do that today. I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I thank you because I've done this. Heaven is my home. God is my father. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Can we give them a hand this morning?